good afternoon and, and thank you so much for the invitation, Carlos. Um, today, I will I'll try to share our vision on scaffold native instability. Uh, needless to say, everything that I'm going to explain comes from a teamwork. And as any team, we need leaders and mentors to follow and here are ours. In this presentation, I'll try to connect with Mar Garcia Elia's previous talks discussing about the use of the term instability when we describe scaffolding problems, expose some ideas about pathomechanics, what changes in biomechanics, diagnosis, treatment, and what we have learned from experience. Let's start with the concept of scaffolonate instability. In this paper, published almost 15 years ago, an attempt of describing the different situations one may face when treating a scaffolonate lesion was made. Based on the presence or absence of the conditions you see on the left, seven theoretical situations or stages can appear. And by placing our patient in one of the stages, a treatment option can be recommended. I am sure many of you are familiar with this. A common mistake is considering this table as a scaffolding instability classification, but it is not. The spectrum of scaffolding problems is wide and goes from a partial but stable lesion a complete but reducible malalignment that can progress to be unreducible and end with a stiff or arthritic slack wrist. Only a part of this spectrum can be named as instability. And as the term instability cannot be applied to all the situations, we now consider that using the term dysfunction or scaffolding dysfunction may be better. As a visual example of what should be considered instable, this construction remains stable until one of the pieces in the lower part is removed. Then for a period of time, the construction is unstable until all the pieces remain unmovable in the floor. Now the construction is collapsed, but it's no more unstable as happens to the collapsed or arthritic carpus. The same happens to a ship in the middle of a storm, the period of maximal instability. Once the boat is stranded on the shore, it's not unstable anymore. And even less unstable if the hull is damaged. It is damaged, but stable. From a practical point of view, it's not the same condition and therefore the same treatment is not needed for a stable partial scaffolding injury, like the one on the left side. A truly unstable carpus as this one on the floor, a static situation or a secondary chondral lesion as this slack wrist on the right side. How can a scaffolding lesion be produced? Is pathomechanics always the same? We've always been told that scaffolding lesions occur after a fall on the outstretched hand. The hand blocks on the floor and the flying body with its high inertial mass generates huge disrupting forces that will be dissipated in the wrist. With this extension and loading, the polar scaffolding ligament is the first to be in danger and break, followed by the scaphalonate interosseous membrane and the dorsal scaphalonate ligament. This classic sequence may end with a perilonate injury if the forces continue to pass through the wrist. But several times we have faced we have faced patients that explain a rotational mechanism 
like someone operating a drill that suddenly gets blocked or someone whose body rotates while hanging in a bar. Sometimes they feel a pop after a high pronation of the carpus with a fixed radius. In these cases, as you see in this cadaver wrist, hyperpronation may cause a rupture of the dorsal scaphalonate ligament first as it widens the dorsal scaphalonate area. So we believe that scaphoid hyperpronation can explain a dorsal scaphalonate ligament and membrane rupture with an intact bolar ligament, thus the opposite as it's mentioned in the classic mechanism. And we see lesions like that in our daily practice. On the left side, this is an ulnar midcarpal portal vision of a right wrist in which there's a chronic complete lesion of the scaphalonate dorsal ligament, but the bolar ligament is still okay. This one, as all the arthroscopic videos in this talk, are from patients we have operated with my partner Mireia Splugas. Or this patient on the right side, from my, patient, uh, from my friend Frederick Festrecken from Belgium, that has a dorsal ligament rupture after a rotatory mechanism. When Frederick applies carpal pronation with the radius fixed, the gap widens as he's reproducing the mechanism of injury. Finally, remember that not only the scaphalonate ligament complex has to be injured to create a true instability. Take a look to these videos from our friends from Kim Klimba in Buenos Aires, Argentina. On the left, you can see what happens when both dorsal and bolar scaphalonate ligaments and the interosseous membranes are cut, but the dorsal intercarpal ligament is intact. Kinematics, it's quite well maintained. But see the great difference when the dorsal intercarpal ligament is detached. On the same way, on the bolar side, remember that the short radiolunate ligament prevents DC as Mark explained on the previous sessions about biomechanics. Which are the biomechanical changes expected in scaphalonate dysfunction? Well, let's start saying that artificially we tend to separate kinetics from kinematics. And we do that because it's easier to understand. But motion and loading occur simultaneously during, di during daily living activities. In a scaphalonate instability, from a kinematic point of view, as far as the ligaments attached to the distal scaphoid work properly, that means STT and the scaphocapitate ligament, the scaphoid will move as part of the distal rope. The lunate, on the contrary, will move less and stay in the anterior medial part of the lunate fossa, as you see in the video on the right side. The scaphoid would not only move different, but it will move more, as it was demonstrated more than 20 years ago. Another interesting fact is that the proximal row almost doesn't move during the dart throwing motion in normal conditions, or at least it almost does not move around the neutral position because we know that the proximal row moves when you get in the extreme positions of the dart throwing motion. But the scaphoid has a lot of motion during dart throwing in the case of a scaphalonate dissociation. You can see it on the right side. This is a dart throwing motion. You see how the scaphoid moves actually from the beginning up to the end. This fact has clinical implications, especially in the postoperative protocols. From a kinetic point of view, when an axial load is applied to the carpus in neutral position with intact ligaments, the pressure centroid 
in the scaphoid fossa displaces slightly bolar in an area with proper cartilage thickness. Quite the opposite, in cases of scaphalonate dysfunction, loading will be displaced dorsally to an area without or with a thinner cartilage not prepared to support forces. This can explain the cartilage degeneration in the scaphoid proximal pole. I'm sorry, this can explain what you see on the, on the left side, why widening is not the big problem. The true problem is dorsal scaphoid displacement secondary to flexion and pronation. And I think all of us have some clinical experience. Gapping is not a big problem. The problem is the flexion of the scaphoid. In summary, in scaphalonate instability, the scaphoid moves more and transmits more pressure in a smaller area. This is what will explain the cartilage degeneration in the scaphoid proximal pole and the dorsal area of the scaphoid fossa of the radius, the so-called slag wrist. Then, after this heavy start, let's move to a more practical field and see how to diagnose a scaphalonate dysfunction. For me, diagnosis starts with two questions. The first one, does this patient have a scaphalonate ligament injury? And the second one, if the answer is yes, is it a partial unstable lesion? Is it an unstable one? Or is a collapsed carpus? Which tools do we have to differentiate these situations prior to make a treatment plan? Well, the first one, it's listening to the patient. Pay attention on the mechanism. If the patient has improved in pain or has to be permanently protected, listen to someone that comes to the office with an orthosis which is frequently used. That means that the patient has pain and problems all the time. Then take time to explore the patient. I will not extend a lot as I know that uh, you will have some sessions on clinical exam of the wrist. But look for the dorsal scaphalonate interval that can be painful. And some patients refer discomfort when palpating the distal scaphoid. The classical clinical test is, as you know, the scaphoid chief test that was described by Watson. The explorer's thumb does not allow scaphoid flexion when bringing the wrist into radial inclination and can create a dorsal painful displacement of the scaphoid proximal pole in cases of scaphalonate instability. More or less, we try to induce what you see on the video. But don't be frustrated if you don't get a positive test very often in the office. I don't get it either. Less frequently, but we have seen it, the patient, him or herself, can come with a clank on the radial and dorsal area of the wrist, as you can see here on the clinical video. If you see on the fluoroscan, it's a sudden flexion of the scaphoid, secondary to a scaphalonate dysfunction. It's not a flexion or extension from the whole proximal row, as in non-dissociative instabilities. This particular patient had a gross instability when we operated him with my colleague, Ana Carreño. And he also had a condition that should be always be checked, which is laxity. We know that hyperlax individuals are somehow special when talking about scaphalonate problems. And we will see that later. And finally, comparative strength has to be tested. Repeated after an aesthetic injection in the injured side, it's useful sometimes, especially in cases with partial painful injuries. The second tool is radiology. The classical signs are still valid. 
the ring sign, the rhythm assigned. On the lateral view, a clearly increased scaphalonate angle. If they are very evident, they will probably reduce a static situation closer to collapse than to instability. So closer to the right side of our table. If standard e plane X-rays are normal, one can use dynamic views. Although I don't know if dynamic is a correct term to call them. They are truly static views in different risk positions, trying to induce malalignment. It is said that in ulnar inclination, the scaphoid and lunate will separate and a gap is created. Again, the gap tyranny, as Mark always says. But many times, the difference between the scaphoid and the lunate is seen in radial inclination, where the scaphoid is abnormally overflexed. So both radial and ulnar inclinations have to be checked. Stress views, let me take out the volume. Stress views in compression and traction can be, can be useful. The first looks for a separation, while the second to create a step and a disturbance of Gilula's line. Take a look to this AP view. The classics are here. The ring sign, Terry Thomas sign, if this risk belongs to a young male that has a history of several trauma, as he does many uh, contact sports, almost all of us will agree that he has a scaphalonate dysfunction. But take a look at the other side. It's the same image, or even worse. This is just a proof that radiological imaging has to be compared always to the uninjured side as well as the clinical exam. Even in the case that good radiological images are obtained, we feel that having a more dynamic exam is more useful. With fluoroscopy, one can change easily the view, focus on the painful area, do an injection, etc. It's, it, I think uh, fluoroscopy is a very useful tool in carpal instabilities. And one last word about radiology. Based on our findings from the lab that Margaret Thiele has explained in the previous webinars, we know that an isometric intracarpal pronation increases the scaphalonate gaps in, in, gap in cases of a complete scaphalonate disruption, as you have seen on the video. And that ECU is the strongest distal row pronator. But we also know now that the pronation effect of the ECU on the distal row is increased in forearm supination at its own here in this video from Mireya. If the forearm is placed in supination, you will see how the scaphalonate gap is much bigger when we pull the ECU tendon compared as if it's placed in neutral position or in pronation. So, combining forearm supination with the effect of the ECU in the carpus with a fixed hand will increase the scaphalonate gap in cases of an unstable lesion. This is why we propose this bilateral ulnar deviation supination stress test or BATS. This view could be a useful radiological tool in order to see instability. On the right side, you can see the same test, but done in fluoroscopy. With the device that you saw on the slide, it can be done at the same time, and you can make measures, and you are not uh, using the other hand to provoke uh, the gapping, as it's uh, been shown in some other works, trying to reproduce this type of uh, view. Finally, ultrasound, it's definitely a good tool to see the dorsal scaphalonate ligament, the scaphoid and the lunate on the dorsal side. It's non-invasive, it can be dynamic, can be done comparatively, 
The only problem is that you need training. And I have to recognize that even with the high sensitivity described and a demonstrated value, we don't use CT and MRI arthrography a lot. Moreover, those explanations have raised new objective measurement tools, as for example, the posterior radioscape weight angle. Nowadays, we use 4D CT for research, but I'm sure that uh, its clinical application will be increased in the future. And finally, arthroscopy. Although it's an aggressive tool, it has changed or might better completed our vision of scaffolding problems. It allows direct vision and testing of the structures involved, but nevertheless, arthroscopy has always to be combined with clinical findings. This video, courtesy of our good friend Fernando Corella from Madrid, shows the different degree of lesions we can find in the scaffolding complex from a grade or stage one lesion in which we see a normal space from the mid carpal joint with a kind of attenuation on the radio carpal view to a grade two in which we are able to introduce the probe between the scaphoid and the lunate as you see here and we are able to twist it a little bit grade three in which we will see that there's an injury of the volar, the dorsal scaphoid ligaments, or both. And depending on that, it will be called grade three A, B, or C. And finally, grade four, in which we are able to go from the mid carpal joint to the radiocarpal joint because the instability allows us to place the camera through the space. Now let me explain how we treat scaphalonate dysfunctions. Our treatment decision process follows four steps. First, know the patient, second, know the lesion, third, have in mind what was our result in similar cases, and after that, four, tailor the treatment for each patient. I will explain the way we do it. So I am not going to review all the possible, possible surgical treatment options, many of them perfectly valid. Knowing the, lesion, knowing the patient uh, may, means taking into account age, work, hobbies, sports, comorbidities, etc. Knowing the lesion means in which point of the scaphalonate lesion spectrum our patient is. What was our result in similar cases means be critic and realistic with our results. We've done many scaffolding surgeries, which means that we have had many complications and frustrating results. So we have to learn from them. And we should also learn from others' experience. And here we have a problem with the scaffolding surgery publications. Look at the conclusions of the evidence-based chapter written for the FESH meeting three years ago. The evidence is suboptimal, number of patients were small, and uh, it's very difficult to allow a meta-analysis with a published result that was only three years ago. I think anything has changed from that uh, point. With all this information, we have to tailor the treatment for that patient. These are the four scenarios that we will describe. A partial lesion, a complete reparable lesion, a complete non-reparable lesion, and a non-reducible lesion or arthropathy. We will start with a partial lesion, which will be placed 
in this side of the scapulonate lesion spectrum. So we can have a painful wrist, but not an unstable wrist. In this type of patients, we will uh, have the, our first step that will be be sure that the patient has only a partial lesion. And for that, we will use all our non-aggressive diagnostic tools, the one that we have been through. If it seems so, we start with conservative treatment, basically proprioceptive reeducation of intracarpal supinator muscles. ECRL and APL have shown in the lab to be intracarpal supinators that can be trained. They can be trained in different ways. And right now, we start to have some evidence that they have the same, the same effect in vivo and that these training programs can work in early stages of scaphoid dysfunction. If there's not enough improvement, an arthroscopic evaluation can be done. It will allow direct vision of the lesion. Sometimes a synovectomy has to be done. And many times, an intracapsular or cold ganglion is found and resected. And you can, as you can see in those cases, one in a radiocarpal view and another one in a midcarpal view. And here you see how the ganglion is going to protrude on the dorsal part of the scaphalonate intervention. Finally, a customized postoperative protocol is applied to that specific patient. The same situation of a partial lesion in a high demand patient can be a little bit different in terms of time. Steps are the same, but they may prefer to shorten times or maybe lengthen them till the end of a sports season ends, for example. In the case of a hyperlax patient, we would insist and extend conservative treatment prior to surgery if it's possible. Let's move and see what we do if we have a complete repairable lesion. That will place us in a still well aligned wrist. Probably in this situation, we can be a little bit more aggressive and, no weight, and not weight too much, as the healing potential of the structures will, will decrease with time and instability may develop. But always consider the type of patient we have, the type of patient we have in front. So we would consider an arthroscopic evaluation to confirm that it's a complete lesion. If it is, try to repair it and do a dorsal capsulodesis. That can be done open as it was described many years ago by Steven Viegas, or arthroscopically, as described not so many years ago by Christophe Mathurin. And that will be followed by a postoperative proprioceptive reeducation of our interesting supinator muscles. Our preferred dorsal repair augmentation or capsulodesis if it's open, it's quite similar to the one described by Steven Viegas, trying to reconnect the dorsal scaphalonate interval and the dorsal intercarpal ligament. Arthroscopically, as described by Mathulen, you try to do the same. Bring the scaphalonate ligament or its remains and stabilize them with the dorsal capsule and the dorsal intercarpal ligament. This is the way we do it. We pass a suture through the capsule and in one side of the scaphalonate dorsal interval, taken out through the other side of the scaphalonate interval and tied to the capsule. In this procedure, one has to be aware of the extensor tendons. We'll pass quickly this video, you just pass the suture, you grasp it, take it out, and then let me show at the end when you tie the knot on the dorsal capsule, how the dorsal table gets more stable. 
what to do in a complete non-reparable lesion. This brings us to different situations, but all of them in a stage of reducible instability. So this will be the stage of uh, probably more instability. Let's see them. In any case, treatment will start with a preoperative period on muscle training. Even if surgery has to be scheduled, scheduled later, learning how to contract and use intracarpal supinators is beneficial, as knee surgeons do right now with anterior crusade ligaments. They rehab the patient before the surgery, even that they know they have to do the surgery with the patient. An arthroscopic evaluation allows lesion, allows to examine the lesion and evaluation of the cartilage. And followed by a ligament reconstruction, a ligamentoplasty that can be open or with arthroscopic support. Many different ligamentoplasties have been described for scaphalonate instability, which obviously means that none is perfect. We strongly believe that the goal is reconstructing partially or completely a complex of ligaments. Margaret Elias mentioned a three-dimensional antipronation helicoidal ligament complex on the previous sessions. But actually, if you think about reconstruction of a complex of ligaments is what most of the techniques try to achieve. The first technique that we used with this principle was the so-called 3LT or 3 ligament thinodesis, which only reconstructed the initial part of the complex. Recently, we changed the tendon used for the reconstruction, the flexor carpi radialis, and we are using the, EC, the e, e, ECRL. Why are we doing that? because we have seen that the ECRL extends and supinates the scaphoid better and avoids using the FCR, which is an important scaphoid stabilizer. ECRL is also longer and allows more complex reconstructions. As you probably all know, this technique starts creating a tunnel in the scaphoid located dorsally and close to the original insertion of the dorsal scaphalonate ligament. Then the tendon is passed through the panel. It is fixed with a bony anchor to a previously created groove in the lunate, reflected in the strong dorsal radiocarpal or dorsal radiotracheal ligament, and then sutured back to itself. This is a clinical example, a 37-year-old male with this symptomatic scaphalonate malalignment. Look how flexed the scaphoid looks in the lateral view. Slight extension of the, of the lunate. And this is the radiological and clinical result almost 15 years after surgery. An arthroscopically guided technique can be used for the same indication. For the last year, we've been using the one designed by Fernando Corella. A scaphalonate loop is created, trying to reconstruct somehow the most radial part of the antipronation ligament complex. The graft is anchored to the scaphoid, to the lunate, and then palmarly to the distal radius. The use of biothinodesis screws, interferential screws, allows avoiding uh, Kisner wire fixation. As I said, it's a mini open technique with arthroscopic guidance. It is perfectly described in these publications here and even in some Boomedi videos. It's true that it requires advanced arthroscopic skill, creation of uh, bowler portals for arthroscopy, and it's better done with assistance used to reach arthroscopy, so you need a team for that. But it has advantages. Less scarring is created, recovery is faster, and better motion is achieved. Results like this can be obtained at four months, which is an unlike result with the standard open techniques. After surgery, again, a customized post-operative protocol is followed. 
But we have mentioned different situations in a complete non-reparable lesion. Indeed, it is different from what we have just described if we have a hyperlax patient, if we have an unstable lunate, or if we have a chronic perilunate instability. In such cases, we would propose the so-called antipronation spiral thenodesis. If just part of the antipronation ligament complex was reconstru reconstructed with a 3LT or with the Correa's technique, the aim of the spiral technique is reconstruct the whole complex. What do we mean by an, an unstable lunate? The one that it's orally displaced because radiocarpal ligaments are not competent enough. This condition will fit better in the category of a complex instability and was described more than 30 years ago by Julio Talisman. Also, this original uh, technique has been modified using ECRL instead of FCR. It starts as the original 3LT, fixing the tendon graft to the scaphoid with an interferential screw. Then the graft is attached to the dorsum of the lunate. A tunnel is created in the trachytum. The graft is fixed to the second tunnel and finally passing close to the volar capsule, it's fixed to the radius. This is one of the first cases we operate with Mark and this is the two year result. Now it's around five years after surgery and I think the patient is doing fine also. And finally, what do we do? when we have a non-reducible lesion or with arthropathy. In those situations, we cannot talk about instability anymore. It, it, it is collapse or arthrosis. What we do, we usually scope the joint. We see how the cartilage looks like and we decide how aggressive we want to be with the so-called palliative techniques. We do a denervation, arthroscopic synovectomy, styloidectomy, or we go for more aggressive techniques as proximal row carpectomy or partial fusions. And at last but not least, what we have learned from our mistakes. We have to distinguish mistake from complication. A mistake is defined as an act or judgment that it's misguided or wrong. On the contrary, a complication is an extra problem that appears and makes the situation more difficult than it previously was. Poor results are not always the consequence of a complication after a ligament reconstruction technique. Forget about that. Sometimes they result from a wrong interpretation of what is unstable and what it's not. So on the left side, this man has a complication, but on the right side, they decided the wrong trying to fuse. So that's not a complication, it's a big mistake. This is a list of complications that can appear after scaphalonate ligament reconstruction. You will be able to find it in a chapter of next year's uh, FESH instructional book, and I'll try to make it a little bit more simple. The most common mistake we have done is performing a ligament reconstruction where it was not indicated. That means when we had had, when we had a collapse rather than an instability, when we were here in our table instead of being here, like in this case, that was a collapse and in any ligament reconstruction had great chances of failure. The second one, it's treating hyperlax. The second thing that we learn, it's treating hyperlax patients carefully. Usually they don't behave exactly the same as the rest of the patients and soft tissue reconstructions may work not so well. This is a patient of mine. He had a complete, easy reducible um, lesion. We perform a spiral reconstruction, but even doing that, uh, very soon 
the wrist collapsed, it was symptomatic and ended with a partial fusion. And he's doing right well, he's doing well right now, but it's been like two years or something like that with a painful wrist. Another thing that we have learned when a scaphalonate ligament reconstruction has failed, better look for another solution and do not try to repeat it because probably you will end or you will still have a painful wrist. And finally, a scaphalonate dysfunction together with a dorsal radius malunion, which is also shortened, it's an unhappy combination. A ligamentoplasty will probably fail and in cases in which you do nothing, a slack wrist may develop faster. And now we have the basic proof of that. We know that from the PhD work from Nuria Fernandez in the lab, creating several types of uh, distal radius malunion and combining it with some uh, ligament injuries, uh, intracarpal ligament injuries on the wrist. And we know that with a shortened and a dorsal malunited radius, it's extremely difficult to control escape weight displacement under loading. So finally, five ideas. The first one is that basic signs are still the key for understanding carpal instabilities. When it's anatomy, we still know to know, we still have to know how the complex of ligaments work, and we need the biomechanics. Second, it's better to use the term dysfunction more than malalignment or stiffness or instability or dyskinesia. Dysfunction is the term that put all these situations together. The third is that not all the scaphalonate spectrum of lesions mean instability. Instability is just a part of scaphalonate lesions. Four, that every type of lesion requires its specific treatment and that treatment has to be tailored for each patient particularly. And finally, I think that we have improved. Yes, we have improved indeed, but there's a, still a long and winding road ahead, as Mark always say. See this word, this sentence from Julio Talesnik, 1995. And I think that these words can be applied right now in most of the cases. Thank you.